we've been going at it. We've been serving like crazy. Yesterday, we were serving all different campuses. We had 60 plus teams out all over the city. We have been doing so much, and we need your help to continue this. So be volunteering, be in part of what God's doing. Because we have had 23 staff members that have been flooded out. We have had hundreds of church members that have been flooded out. And one of them is the Davis family that's here, Clark and Tina Davis, who have been members of our church for 20 years now, which is amazing to think about, and good friends, and they have been flooded out as well. And I just wanted y'all to come and share your journey, your thoughts, just all that you've been going through, because it's symbolic of hundreds of people of what's happening, and so that we can pray for you and just hear what's happening. So Clark, tell us what, what happened. Well, we live on the west side of Houston. Uh, behind us, we have a small man-made lake And two blocks on the other side, we have the bayou. So we're like a peninsula between them both. So starting Sunday, the water started to rise. We've never been flooded ever. We said, no, it's not going to hit us. But at that time, back in our back of our neighborhood, we had about four or five feet. I happened to have a John boat that the past owners of the house just left. And so we pulled out the John boat, some neighbors and I, and we started going back and getting people out of their houses. They couldn't get out. One particular gentleman had had a stroke a couple years ago and was paralyzed on the left side and hypersensitive on his right. But he could only, he couldn't go up and downstairs, difficult walking, one story. He could only be on the first story and the water was rising. And we were able to get him out with about eight other guys and we got him out. People I didn't even know in our neighborhood. Then we didn't flood that night. So we're thinking we're high and dry, we're good. And the next day we started getting more people out. We ended up getting over a dozen families out during this time. We had to walk back in because we didn't have a motor. We didn't have enough life jackets. And when we got back into the back of the neighborhood, at that point, the water was over our heads. So we got some families out. And the last family we got out, we were trying to come out against the current. And we couldn't get out. So we were stuck because we'd walk and you wouldn't go anywhere. So we moved up next to the houses. And that was always dangerous because you're running into mailboxes, into cars, in the post, you know, in the uh, fire hydrants, everything. But we were able to pull ourselves around on the house and grab the cars un- that were underwater to pull ourselves out. And as we came around the corner with this last family, I was never more happy than to see the Coast Guard. And I saw him, and I, I was exhausted, and you're cold, and you've been underwater to your chin. And so basically, I said, I, I can't do it anymore. And they go, We've been living for this day. (laughs) So they took over. That night we flooded. We lost our first floor, three cars. My daughter's sitting over here. We got her out the day before because she had had surgery on her hip and we didn't think we could get her out. She was a little disappointed that I put her car in the driveway, said I sacrificed it. (laughs) I did. And so uh, (laughs) she was not real happy about that, but we made it. We lost that, lost the first floor. At that time, we rented a house, knowing it was gonna be difficult to get a house. We didn't have any furniture, though. We had furniture upstairs, so we're thinking we'd moved everything upstairs, so we're good. At that point, the next day, a pipe burst in the attic. So it flooded from the down, from the top, so we lost everything upstairs, for the most part, too. But our family's safe, we're out, and no one was injured in our neighborhood. It's an amazing story to think about that, yes. You know, you never think about standing in your front yard in chest deep water and you said the Coast Guard was dropping baskets down to rescue people and all sorts of things that were happening that were going on. What did you learn from this, Clark? Well, family and faith. And family can be defined in a lot of ways. As I was going into the water, Tina kept saying, just come back. We need you here. So, you know, family was very important. We were able to get the family out. But our family grew, our church family. We, had not, we don't have any furniture. You know, you can rent a house, and that's great. But if you have nothing to sit on, nothing to lay on, what do you do? So we rented this house. The lady took the house off the market for, for sale and put it up for rent. And two hours later, we rented it. She felt bad for us, so she put a welcome mat out and bought us a refrigerator. So our church family has been there to help us. So what have I learned? We're not asking why. It's okay to ask why. We're just not. We feel blessed. 
We can rebuild, it's just stuff. And the things that were important to you that you don't realize are important come out in these times. My mom's portrait, her wedding portrait, was very important to me. She's passed away, my father's passed away, and my dad's last photograph. Both of those, Tina put into a, a bucket, a plastic bucket. So the upstairs, when the upstairs flooded, they floated. That wasn't us. That was God. So he protected the things that we knew needed to be protected. So what have we learned? Probably the, the flip side of it is, is that we have a lot of stuff <laughs> that we really don't need in our lives. And I just kind of equate it. It's, there's probably a lot of things in everybody's life that we just don't need. And we've learned that. That's good. That's so good. Tina, tell us a little bit about, you know, we always talk about there's a blessing in the storm. God's at work in some ways. And what, what have you seen has just been a blessing through this? Um, we've seen countless blessings. And so many people, we don't even know their name. Um, groups coming to help us has been amazing. Just church family, but even like U of H sent a bunch of young guys yesterday, help us clean out that garage. Yay, we finally got the garage clean. <laughs> but um, three in particular, uh, the first being um, my sister, um, single mom of three children, and um, you know, over the years, we've helped her, we've helped several, we're usually the helpers. We're the ones giving. So it was very difficult for us to be on the other side wanting to, or receiving the help. And Pastor Greg's sermon last Sunday was perfect for Clark and myself, that it was okay to say, we need help. That Because we would be the ones standing in line at Walmart for two hours because no, no, other people need it. And um, she had lost her job uh, almost a year ago and of course was distraught. And um, my husband, uh, Clark, talked to her and who is always helping her, um, and she found that maybe the realtor business would be what she would try. I mean, this was now, it's see, we can see that God pre-planned all of that. She has this expertise now. She has her license. She immediately got on and found us a rent house, so she was able to bless us and has been helping us every step of the way. Um, so she has been a huge blessing to our family. Secondly, our neighborhood, there are several people we didn't know, um, and it was great seeing everyone pull together, all races, religions, socioeconomic. It was amazing, especially in our world today, all the negative that's out there. It was so much positive we've seen. And thirdly, and most importantly, we have a neighbor that lives right beside us, not a Christian, total different faith. Um, we haven't had much interaction with them, and through all of this, we've gotten to know them first name basis, um, his uh, meeting his family, and his heart softening towards our faith, and it's different, and letting us, our church, come in and help. Justin and Tony brought some um, teenage girls and boys, this huge group in this last week, and uh, they were a lot... They were able to minister to our neighbor, and he opened his doors and had them help him. And at the end, we had a prayer circle um, on our street with those, or Tony, or, um, Justin had, and asked um, this man, would he like to join our prayer circle and be prayed for? It's most definitely, um, and it's just been amazing all the, how we've really gotten to know this family. And so if, they find Jesus because our house was flooded in the grand scheme of things. I mean, how awesome is that? I, I, I can't even be upset about our house if he becomes, to, he knows the Lord. So it's been an, a, a crazy ride, that's for sure. Awesome. And one other thing Clark wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Our neighbor, we went in and helped and the church went in and helped him. He came out afterwards and he said, to me, he goes, Clark, are all you Baptists so happy all the time and helpful? And I said, of course. Well, then yesterday, three ladies from our neighborhood walked in and asked if they could help, and they helped him, and they asked, could they pray with him? And he said, yes. And so he prayed with them again, and again said, well, what church do you go to? He goes, well, we're Baptists. 
So he came out and he goes, are your Baptists everywhere and always so helpful? And I said, of course we are. But I think one of the, Justin did one quick other thing. He ran into a gentleman in our neighborhood who came up to Justin and said, I'm an atheist. Laid down a few four letter words in, the, in it. Justin said, I understand. Started talking to him, ministering to him. And that gentleman told Justin that he was feeling something inside that he'd never felt before. So, you know, in tragedy and in things like this, you move forward. So overall, we're good. That's great. In fact, we're great. That's awesome. Well, thank y'all for sharing your story because it is symbolic of hundreds of people in our church and thousands of people in our city that are going through some of the same things and just your faith in, in it and being able to, to be with you guys through it all and be texting and, and talking and just seeing you guys rising up of, of the Lord just using you in a great way. So we just wanna pray for you and just, um, just really lift you up in a word of prayer. So church, let's pray, all campuses. We're gonna pray for the Davises, Lord. Just we come and they are symbolic of so many. And we give you praise, God, that you did protect their lives, Lord, that you did protect them as they were going through, wading through neck deep water, bumping into sunken cars that they didn't realize were even there, Lord. We just come and we thank you that you gave protection. We pray that you would use this, Lord, in a powerful way, God, in their lives, their neighborhood, and countless neighborhoods and lives around our city. Father, we come as well and we pray for our friends in Florida that right now in this moment, Lord, that are being affected by Irma. And so we lift them up. We pray for protection for them, that you would guard life and property and, and ju just dissipate the storm. Let it weaken, Father. We're just calling out. We're just a couple weeks ahead of them on what they're going through, Lord. And so we just pray for them as well. Thanks for the, the Davises and their faith and the ways that they're shining with you. And we just tell you we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Y'all just say thanks to them if you would. So good, so good for us to be able to just hear stories coming out of the storm of what God can do in the midst of all of these things. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians. We'll be there in just a little bit, but I'm gonna give you a little review of last week. But first of all, as you're turning there, I wanna welcome all of our campuses, Cyprus online with us, downtown, and particularly Siena Plantation, the first time they've been able to worship together in two and a half weeks because they've been in mandatory evacuation. So Siena, we applaud you and your courage. The difference you're making out there, we got a white tent set up with supplies coming in in Siena, great things happening at all of our campuses. So we're live right now throughout the whole city for us to be able to declare these words of truth um, that are happening and that what we can declare here, which is a great thing. Last week, if you look, we, we talked about a couple things. We talked about that there was an upper story that God was doing something in heaven. There was something happening in heaven that we had to have the upper story and we had to understand. And then there was something happening in, on earth. And we've gotta be able to connect the stories of heaven and earth. If you only look at earth, man, we got wildfires in uh, California, we got earthquakes in Mexico City, we got a hurricane in Florida, we're still wounded from a hurricane here. It's bad news all over the place if all you look is planet Earth. This is a bad thing, this is a terrible thing. There's a lot of suffering going on, and there will be, and there always has been. But we've gotta look at heaven and say, God, you've got a plan, you've got a story. There's something going on that's happening here that we don't see there. And what connects the two of these is the cross of Jesus Christ. So the cross of Christ is what connects these two. He's the biggest picture of connecting the heavenly story with the earthly story. God's one and only son came to earth so that those on earth could put their faith in him and they could go to heaven. What an amazing thing that is. So even in the Lord's prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. So we talked about we've got to see the heavenly story, that there's an unseen script being written. Even though we see all this on earth, We've got to trust that there's a heavenly story. Have you let Jesus Christ into your heart to save your soul, place your faith in him so that you can have the connection between heaven and earth, so that the one who came from heaven can take you from earth to heaven? We talked about as well that if you had been unaffected by the storm, that God has protected you to use you. That's the category our family is in. He's protected us to use us so that we can be out, hands and feet. Yesterday, we were in homes. We were helping to take out sheetrock. I'm not a handy person, I can promise you that. But let me tell you this, this is what I learned. If you can follow instructions and you can take a bucket of sheetrock to the street, God can use you. That's what I learned. You don't have to know a bunch of stuff. Somebody else will tell you what to do and you just figure it out. It's demolition is a lot easier than construction, deconstruction. I can, I can break things, I can't make things, okay? So, 
We need you to volunteer every campus. You're gonna hear more specifics about how you need to be involved and how you can be involved. We're not asking you to be involved every single weekend. We're asking you, though, that you would give one weekend. You would take one shift. Every one of us would take one shift to say, we're gonna be involved in some way, shape, or form. We know you got grandma's birthday coming up, and then there's homecoming happening, and then there's a football game you've been planning on going to. We understand that. We don't want you to feel guilty. But we do need all of us to step in at some point and not just let it be for somebody else. So go to the website, sign up, say I wanna volunteer. We'll help you get all the information about that and all you gotta do is take a bucket or a wheelbarrow out to the street or do whatever it needs to do and God will use you in a great way. So if you've been unaffected, you've been unaffected so that God can use you. If you've been affected, if there's been water in your house, we said, well, first thing that's gotta happen is you've gotta grieve. You gotta just cry your eyes out and grieve that your home has been maimed. That's a big deal. Then you've gotta be able to receive help from other people, as the Davis has talked about. And then you gotta let it go for God's purposes and say, God, this is your home. You do what you wanna do with it, and I trust you with it. That's where we were last week. Now, I wanna show you in 2 Corinthians, it's where we're gonna be this week, where we were last week. We kicked off the chapter last week. We're gonna do verses five through eight is what we're gonna start with, and uh, five through seven, and here we go with it. This is what we're gonna look at today. Here's what it says in verse five. I want you to have your pens ready, have your minds ready, everybody get ready. Here we go. For as the sufferings of Christ overflow, circle overflow, overflow to us, so through Christ our comfort also overflows. Verse six, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Heavenly story happening. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which is experienced in your endurance, we're gonna talk about that, your endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. Verse seven, and our hope, we have hope, and our hope for you is firm, because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you will share in the comfort. The first words that we get to, it talks about overflowing. The comfort of Christ is abundant, it's abundant. Some of your verses of scripture say that the comfort of Christ is abundant. It is overflowing. Literally, this Greek word means to abound, to abound. So when it says the comforts of Christ are overflowing, it means that the comfort of Jesus to you and to me is abounding. It's overflowing. It is abundant. Now, we should learn this through every day of our life, but particularly in this midst of a hurricane. Jesus is more than enough. Not just enough, more than enough. I want you to say more than enough with me. Ready? One, two, three. More than enough. Again, more than enough. He's not just adequate. He's not just top of the glass. He is overflowing from the overflow of the heart. The mouth will speak. He is abundant. Jesus can do more in you than you could ever imagine. Now, we are in our city in a time where we are seeing things in the frame lens or in the lenses of depletion. I don't know if FEMA will give me enough money. I don't know if insurance will cover enough for our house. I don't know if I have enough time to actually make it to work in all this traffic that's happening. I don't know if I got enough energy to really serve, Pastor. I know you're talking about just give one week in a month, but man, we're really busy people. And I don't know if I, I, don't know if I got the skills to take sheetrock out and to take it to the curb. I don't know if I got the heart to be able to do that. I kinda wanna stay away in my own little spot. I don't want to get in all the mess in the muck. We are looking through lenses of depletion. And I want to give you new glasses today, if you will, of lenses of abundance. Jesus Christ is more than enough. He is more than adequate. He is greater than FEMA. He is greater than insurance. He is stronger than any sandbag at your door. Jesus is more than enough. And it says the comfort of Christ overflows to us through his afflictions. How afflicted was Jesus? Nails in his hands, nails in his feet, sword in his side, crown of thorns on his head, Blood and water flowing, beaten on his back almost to death, laid in a borrowed tomb. He was afflicted by being falsely accused, being falsely condemned, dying a death that he did not need to die for you and I to pay for our sins. Jesus was afflicted. He was so afflicted so that we could look at the cross and say, Lord, you connect the heavenly story and the earthly story. I trust in you and you are more than enough for me. 
And from that affliction, could he have been afflicted any more than what he was? From that affliction comes the abundance of comfort. So that we can say, if you loved us that much, you can love us even in the midst of the storm, and we can trust you. The afflictions of Christ. Look at the afflictions of Joseph. Why was Joseph so afflicted in the Old Testament? He was afflicted so that he could get to a place that he could then provide comfort for his family to give to them food in the midst of the famine. He had more than enough so that he could provide for them who did not have enough. It's a picture of Christ. Look at Paul. Paul is given affliction all throughout. We'll see here at the end of the the message, he says he's afflicted even past the point of that, that he can take it. And Paul was a tough guy. That was from Acts chapter 19 when a riot formed in Ephesus when he began to preach against uh, the, uh, the temple of Diana and the silversmiths began to come against him and wanted to kill him. And he says, no, even in the midst of that, Jesus was more than enough. He's the one that wrote, For I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was Paul. So Jesus was giving us comfort. Joseph is symbolizing comfort in the Old Testament. Paul is showing comfort that we can walk with Christ in strength. Now it says here that you will be comforted with overflowing comfort. What does this word comfort really mean? Don't see from a place of lack. See from a place of abundance. Jesus gives us more than we need. He's more than enough. And we receive comfort from him. What is comfort? Here's what I think about comfort. I think about, you know, I'm about seven years old and I skin my knee on my bike and my mom puts her arm around me and says, it'll be okay, Greg, don't worry. And I go, oh yeah, thank you, it'll be okay. And there's a little bit of comfort that happens right there with mama. That's what we think about with comfort, real soft, real listening, real sweet. The Greek word for comfort that he is using means this, with strength, with strength. Now, there's a time for comfort that you you weep on somebody's shoulder. There's no question about that. There's a time to grieve. There's a time to cry. There's a time where we just have somebody just sit and listen and kind of just stroke us and and pat us on the shoulder kind of thing and say, it's going to be okay. But there's another moment that strength comes with comfort. See, great comfort results in hope to move forward. Hear that again. Great comfort, or true comfort, I should say, results in hope to move forward. It gives you strength when you comfort somebody in their grief after the loss of a loved one. In that comfort comes, you're going to make it another day. The sun will rise. Take just one more step. Take just one more breath. When you comfort somebody that's lost their home and their cars and all the things in the flooding, you're able to put your arm around them and, yes, let them weep and weep with those who weep, but also to say, okay, now we're going to rise up, let's put on some gloves, let's grab a hammer, and let's get this sheetrock and insulation out of here, right? We're going to take one step today. It's a long march with insurance. It's a long march if you didn't have insurance. But God is saying, I want to give you strength as I comfort you to move forward with what is happening here. So we see comfort as a place of strength that moves us forward. It truly comforts us. Now, I always liked when I was growing up the Peanuts cartoons, you know, Snoopy and the whole gang. Well, here's a great cartoon for us with with Snoopy and the gang here. So we we got Lucy, we got Linus, and Lucy says, boy, look at the rain. What if it floods the whole world? You asked that question lately? Linus says, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised that Noah would, that that would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. Next little slides here. You've taken a great load off my mind. Now watch this. Sound theology has a way of doing that. (laughs) Amen, Linus. Preacher Linus, right? (laughs) Pastor Linus here. Sound theology has a way of taking a load off our minds. So I'm not giving you, hey, everything's gonna be better. Everything may get worse. Aren't you glad you came to church today? (laughs) It really might. But God's saying, I've got strength that's coming from the affliction of my son dying for you. And his death is the fountain and resource that then is more than enough for you to live life and to be able to come. Sound theology has a way of taking a load off our mind. God, we trust you. And what happens from that, that abundance and that strength leads us to the next thing which is found in verse six. It says, which produces in you patient endurance. We need patient endurance to live well. 
So the abundance of Christ, the verse tells us, is through the sufferings and affliction of Christ. Then we are able to be strengthened with comfort, with strength. And this happens so that this will produce in you, he's very clear, it'll produce in you what? Patient endurance. Patient endurance. This is a long road of marathon, is it not? Single adults, let me just tell you this, if you're going to get married, you're going to need to learn patient endurance in marriage. Even if you got a great marriage, that husband is not Jesus, okay? You're going to have to learn patient endurance with him. Even if you get married, men, that lady, as sweet as she is, at some point she's not going to be that sweet every time, okay? You got to learn patient endurance. It's two humans coming together. And it takes patient endurance so that we're comforted in Jesus. We look to Jesus in our marriage. He's got to be the resource, not her or him. He's the resource from which we live. And now I show my love through that. So he's saying, I want you to have patient endurance. And that's what it's going to take. It's going to take realizing life's difficult. Life's very, very hard. We can have another hurricane. We're going to have another hurricane some point. Let's hope it's years away, obviously. It's going to happen again. There's going to be flooding that's going to happen. I mean, it's, this is planet Earth. This is how it works. Now, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged that we can rise up above that with the heavenly story of what God's doing. And so with strength and with faithful, faith, faithful perseverance, enduring perseverance, we can walk these things out. Listen to C.S. Lewis. He gives these words in his book, A Grief Observed, about his wife's death. Here's what he says, feelings, feelings, feelings. Let me try thinking instead. From a rational viewpoint, what new factor has my wife's death introduced into the problem of the universe? What grounds has it given me for doubting all that I believe? I already knew that these things happened and worse happened daily around the world. I, I would have said that I would have taken them all into account and I've been warned, I've warned myself, I know better, better to, than to reckon in worldly happiness. We are even promised sufferings. They're a part of the program. We're even told, blessed are those who mourn, and I have accepted it. I have gotten nothing that I have not bargained for. But of course, it is different when it happens to oneself. Not to others, but in reality, not in imagination. It's different when it happens to us and we feel our endurance beginning to wane and to be able to pull back. And God says, I want to comfort you with strength so that you can patiently endure. Do you know that in the same time Hurricane Harvey happened, there was typhoons in Mumbai? And in Mumbai, 1,200 people at least were killed, died. It didn't even make our news report. And we've got our own stuff going on, but I'm just telling you, if we don't find comfort in the heavenly story, it's very bleak. And we have to have patient endurance to be able to walk this thing out and say, Lord, we trust you even when it happens to us. When it happens to somebody else, oh, that's sad. When it happens to us, it's catastrophic. To let the strength of God rise us up. Winston Churchill said it like this. Never give in, never give in, never, 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 never in nothing, great or small, large or petty, never give in except to the convictions of honor and good sense. Never give in. Now, that is not a good phrase for your marriage, okay? So don't just strike that. It's not good. But with him standing against Hitler when everybody was saying appease Hitler is what they were telling him, appease Hitler, just give him Poland and he'll stop. He said, no, never give in, never give in, never give in. And I'm telling you, Jesus is saying with patient endurance, never give in. Keep walking out your faith and letting God do something great. And so we had all, all my plans were wrecked in the sense of this is minuscule school of, of doing First John. We're going to do that in October, but September is let's heal from Harvey. Don't give in. Keep preaching the word. Keep going for it. I prayed a lot about those plants. Throw them away. Let's take the new. Let's go with what God's doing and let God do his work and let him rally us in a great way. Now, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Next verse. These next three verses, we're going to hit them quick, but they're very, very key. Here we go in verse 8. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. I want you to write in the margin, Acts 19. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about in Ephesus 
when there was a riot formed and they wanted to kill Paul, okay? It's good when we know our Bibles, right? Good theology has a way of uh, taking a load off our minds. So now you know what that's about. So Acts 19 is what verse eight is about. Now listen to the end of verse eight. We were completely overwhelmed. Do you think Paul agrees with our refrigerator magnets that God will never give you more than you can handle? No. Greek word for that, baloney. <laughs> baloney. Can you handle four feet of water in your house? No, you can't. Can you handle the death of a loved one? No, you can't. Completely overwhelmed. And if you've never been completely overwhelmed, you have not lived long enough. It's coming. It's coming, not because God is mean, but because God is good, you'll see, and allows us to turn to him. So he says, I was completely overwhelmed. If you and I could handle it, guess what? We would. God has rigged it that we need the heavenly story to make sense of the earthly mess. Completely overwhelmed, beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life. Indeed, we personally had a death sentence within ourselves so that we would not, hear it, would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises from the dead. You see the difference? I'm not trusting in myself, I'm trusting in God. He delivered us from such a terrible death and he will deliver us. He, we have put our hope in him that he will deliver us. Verse 11, while you join in helping us, how can we help? Join in helping us through your prayers. Then many will give thanks on behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. Two things and we're gonna wrap up. How do you get through this? How do we make it through something like this? Here's how we make it through. Number one, we rely on God's power. We rely on his power, rely on Christ the Savior, not yourself. Rely on Christ the Savior, not yourself. Sienna, hear me loud and clear. It's not in a master plan community. It's not in a levy that we rely. It is in Christ the Savior. Cyprus here that we rely, not in suburbia, we rely in Christ the Savior downtown in the middle of all that's going on. We rely in Christ the Savior, the loop the same way, Espanol, Christ the Savior, his power. I could do all things, period would be the way the world would say it. I could do all things, comma, through Christ who strengthens me is the way the Bible says it. We rely on the power of God. You do not have enough strength to make it through life on your own. You don't have enough. I don't have enough. I need God. I need Jesus. I need Christ. I need help. I need mercy. I need forgiveness. I need hope. Rely on the power of God. This is what it means before we go to our last point. We trust in the upper story more than we trust in the lower story. We surrender our lives to the upper story. I was created for something higher and greater instead of just saying I was created to go to work and make some money and try to keep this thing comfortable. Surrender to the upper story, trusting in the power of God. Paul, who was strong, says I was, I was overwhelmed. I couldn't do it. Jesus had to do it in me. Number two, we rely on others' prayers. We rely on others' prayers. Did you see that in verse 11? We rely on the prayers of others. Rest in the prayers of the people. Can I just tell you a lot of times when we say, I'm praying for you, it's kind of like a Christian sign off, like, see you tomorrow, right? <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow on World News Tonight. As we, you know, I mean, it's, it's a Christian sign off. And I have done this, and you've probably done this, praying for you, and we walk away, and we forget to pray for them. Right? We walk away and we're like, oh, I forgot to pray for somebody. Sometimes I've, I've ended the night and said, Lord, for everybody I forgot to pray for that I said I was going to pray for, I'm praying for right now. Lord, help. <laughs> so here's what I've done. A few years ago, I just decided this. When I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, I either pray for them right there. I mean, like, can I pray for you? Yeah, let's pray. I mean, let's just do it right here. I don't know. That's kind of embarrassing. Hey, be embarrassed for your faith. Walk with God. If you're embarrassed for your faith all the time, you don't have much of a faith, okay? Walk with Him. And for the 17 people clapping, amen. Yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> for the rest of you, life will go on, all right? It'll be fine. You just pray for somebody. They'll appreciate it. So I either pray for them right there, or as I walk away, I just say, Lord, I just pray for that right now. God, I just lift that up to you. I give that to you. God, you do your work. Just in the quietness, a little whisper in my lips. 
resting in the prayers of the people is not a Christian sign off. It's not something trite we just kind of love you lots. It's not just something we just say and it's just a kind of an emoji of, you know, that's not what it is. <laughs> it is this and this on our knees, right? It's God doing something. So he's saying, how are we gonna make it through? Hear me loud and clear. The power of God and the prayers of the people. That's how you're gonna make it through. And when you go through a difficult time of suffering, here's what happens. When somebody says, I'm praying for you, you go, oh, thank you. Thank you. I need that. Tell me more. What have you been praying for me? How have you been praying for me? Would you pray more for me? Would you pray for me right now? I receive. Sometimes when people are praying for me, I'll just hold my hands open symbolically. Lord, I receive. I need it. The reason we do not pray is not because we are too busy. The reason we do not pray is because we are too confident. And when you don't receive prayers deeply and you just take them as a little emoji sign off, here's the deal. You're way too confident. And I'd rather start on my knees than to be forced to my knees. I'm going to just, li- this is how I'm doing. I'm going to live on my knees. And as I live on my knees, then come hell or high water, I'm already on my knees. Humbleness is not an issue that I, I need God to show me in, in a way to shove me down. I want to start in humility and pray from there for power. Instead of thinking I got great power and then ask God for great more power and then let him humble me in that. So begin on your knees. Walk in fragility. Have we not learned how fragile we are? We think we made it through in our brick houses. Put us in a straw hut in Mumbai and see how good you and I do. It doesn't work. We are fragile and we need the prayers of the people and the power of God. This is kind of my things to do journal. I've tried for years to move to, you know, this app will show me this and this computer will do that. I need to write down with a pen and a paper what I need to get to do today and write it down. Call me old school, but I'm getting it done, all right? So write it down. Make it happen, and here we go. So I've had this with me. That sounds real, after I talk about humility, like I'm really prideful about that. I mean, I'm, by the grace of God, getting to do do these things, but anyway, another sermon later. (laughs) We gotta go to lunch at some point. Just trust my heart. So I've had this thing with me. I hadn't slept with it, but it's been on my bedside because every little idea I have about Harvey, everything, meetings, I mean, I got pages of Harvey stuff in here, just pages and pages. One of the things I started writing down I could probably find the date for you here. Um, Doesn't matter, but somewhere in here, right as Harvey was coming in, I started getting texts from people. And I just started writing down every person that texted me from basically outside the city of Houston because, you know, we were all texting each other. But people that were outside our church, outside the city also, I just wrote down, when they would text me, I'm praying for you, I just was just like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And I just write it down. And I have here two columns now going up the side and over here. I've run out of room because this page is filled over here. I need to jump to this page. And so I've got here, I've got 47 names here of people that prayed for me. And I just said, dear Jesus, God Almighty, I need those prayers as you're giving our church an opportunity to lead in our city. We need these. We're walking in these. We don't take these lightly, and some of these, about five or six of these, are pastor friends from Florida. And now I'm praying for them. One of their churches sent us $10,000. We're going to like rip up the check and send it right back to them (laughs) so that we could have disaster relief. I mean, all this stuff. Rest in the prayers of the people of God, in the power of God, not in your brick home, not in your water bottles. Not in your workplace, not in your money, not in your stuff. In the power and prayers of the people is all you're going to take with you when that coffin shuts. That's it. That's where we start for a meaningful life here on planet Earth. I close with this last illustration that just wraps it up perfectly. As the rain was falling, as the wind was raging, as the storm was coming in, as all the stuff was happening, you remember the dark of days, the dark of night when we didn't see blue skies forever, it felt like. And they were still having people getting hurt, and they were bringing in life light helicopters into St. Joseph Hospital in downtown Houston, just two blocks away from our downtown campus. 
And so they were bringing them in, and this is what the, the people were telling us. A, a church member of ours sent me a picture I'll show you in just a second. They were saying on the radio, here's what they were telling the helicopter pilots, look for the cross. You know the St. Joseph cross right there on the Pierce Elevated? It was lit up in the middle of night, never lost power, lit up in all the storm, all the dark, all the rain, all the stuff. It was lit up. They would tell the helicopter pilots, look for the cross. The helicopter pilots would respond back, 10-4, I see the cross. And this is the picture from the landing that our church member gave. No separation of church and state when the state needs the church. <laughs> and we honor the state, and we want to help the state, all of that. But look for the cross was a life-saving phrase. And people would come in wounded and hurt. And I'm telling you today, as clear as I could possibly say it, look for the cross. Amen. Look for the cross. It's sound theology that'll take a load off your mind. It'll make you where you never, 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 never give in. Students, don't give in to peer pressure. Never give in. Keep walking with Jesus. Keep going. And you will be comforted with strength so that you can endure patiently and to see, maybe it's when you get to heaven, how the heavenly story and the earthly story connect. But we say yes to you, God. And what will happen is when the rain falls, the church rises. Father God, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your power, for your strength, for your word that 2 Corinthians is so perfect for where we are right now. We need you in Siena. We need you in downtown. We need you in Cyprus and Espanol in the loop. We need Jesus. And we just come and we say, look for the cross. Look for the cross in the middle of the night. That's where we come. May we trust in your power. May we trust in the prayers of your people. Do your work, God. For those that don't know Jesus as Savior, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, he loves you. He wants to connect the heavenly story with the earthly story you've been living to free you from sin. Place your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. Ask him to forgive your sins and come in your heart and life. You can come and talk to somebody at any of our campuses about that. Come join our church. This is the kind of church we are. Plant your life here. We need you. We need you. Humbly, we need more. The fields are wide under harvest, but the labors are few. We don't have time to be messing around with, well, I don't know if I like this or that. We need people that jump in and say, God, plant me in a great place. And so we ask for that, God. Bring that and let us walk with you, God. May we worship you now in song as we respond to the power of Jesus. Amen.